Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for September 9th, 2020. I'm Joe Lynch. Joining me today on the Somerville School System update is uh, Ward 2 School Committee member Ilana Krepchen and from the Somerville Public School System, a, the Innovation Specialist, the one and only Jason Behrens. Good afternoon all. Ilana, how are you? How's the family? I'm well, everyone is well, thank you. How are you, Joe? I'm very good, very good. Long holiday weekend, I'm back at it. Jason, how are you? Doing okay over here, um, hanging in there, you know, working around the clock, just like everyone else uh, good. to prepare for the school year. Good, most important, everybody's healthy, everybody's doing okay. We are going to do an update for, um, since the last time that I met with school, committee or the superintendent's office, um, we were fairly certain that Somerville Public Schools will go back to school on September 18th in a complete virtual online system. Did I make a correct statement there, Ilana? That is correct, Jim. Okay. So we really don't know at this point what the end date will be. We may have to be very flexible that Maybe in around Thanksgiving or possibly sooner, we may have something else that we can announce. But for now, Ilana, that's the schedule. September 18th, fully virtual. That's correct. And we do not have an end date at this point. Okay. So and we will move into a hybrid model. Great. So then what I want to I want to do, Ilana, if you could just kind of give us a quick update on um, school committee, where it is, where are you going, and then we'll switch over to Jason and he can talk about some of the more innovative, see how, what I did there, Jason? More innovative ways of teaching um, in a virtual world. Ilana, why don't you take it away? Sure, thanks. So uh, last week, the school committee and the Somerville Teachers Union signed a memorandum of agreement, which essentially lays out how the working conditions are changing in this fully remote model. So it lays out um, essentially how many hours teachers are required to be teaching, both synchronous and asynchronous. So actually in front of the screen with either the entire class or a small group or one-on-one, -on -one, and then also time for kids to be working on small group projects, et cetera. So the school day will essentially look the same hour-wise uh, as a typical school day in the school is. So from about 8 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. But that doesn't mean that all kids and all teachers will be staring at their screen for that full six hours. And I'll let Jason talk about that more when he takes over because he has more um, of the ins and outs of that. But that's essentially what the memorandum of agreement is about. We still have to work on some more issues with the teachers union that we're still negotiating that's ongoing. So we did not yet figure out exactly what the hybrid plan will look like, um, but that is coming in the next few weeks. It's an ongoing negotiating process. Um, so those are the main updates in terms of the schedule. The kids all got their teacher assignments last week. Uh, this coming week, by the end of this week, they're due to be getting their cohort assignments. So even though we are fully remote, in the planning for when we become hybrid, the kids are being assigned an A, actually I'm not sure what it's called, I think it's an A and B cohort, but essentially that what, so that when they return, they know which days they will be returning in person. And that also means that for some of the outdoor activities that the community schools and rec department are organizing, those can be organized so that can be seamlessly continued when we return in that uh, hybrid model. So those cohort assignments should be coming by the end of this week as well as detailed descriptions of what the daily schedule will look like. So what I mentioned was sort of broad picture schedules um, in the negotiating table, but the specifics will be coming out later this week. The other sort of important update for people to be aware of is what we heard about in our recent finance subcommittee meeting which is that uh, right now we're down about 300 students enrollment, people who have moved away, people who have decided to pull their kids and go to private school, people who have decided to pull their kids and homeschool. There's a whole variety of, of different uh, reasons for this. But at the end of the day, we're down about 300 students. We're not sure at this point if those students are coming back or not. 
And from a money perspective, what this means is that next year we'll be down about $1.2 million from the state. Because the way it works is that the state looks at your numbers from October of the previous year to determine how much money they're gonna give you based on the number of students in October. So if people out there are uh, worried about this, as they should be, um, one sort of course of action and recommendation is to talk to your state legislatures, legislators because there is a movement to um, hold districts harmless about this and look at last year's numbers when determining next year's finances. So those are the two big updates that I have. Um, yeah, go ahead. So, Joanna, before we get to Jason, let me ask you a couple of questions on the update. It appears as though we have most of the issues that would be involved with the unions. We have those worked out at this point. Everything that we need to have worked out to start the school day remotely on September 18th has been worked out. Great. Issues okay. I'm talking about are more ongoing in terms of- In, in case the plan changes. Right. Exactly. Got yep. it. So hopefully the teachers understand that, you know, we may have to go back to the drawing board if the plan changes at some point in the future. And there may be more things that we have to talk it's about. It's an ongoing negotiating process. Got Absolutely. it. And then as far as the students go, you had talked about um, the assignments. So kids are feeling comfortable now. They know who their teacher is gonna be. The cohort assignments for those new, those of us who are new to that terminology. Yep. It just gives some predictability to the kids as to who they're going to be in those online classes with. Yes, um, and so it, it's essentially just dividing each class into two pieces so that when we return to a hybrid model, you only have half the number of students physically in the building. And, and does the reason we did that, uh, not only in my mind for predictability, but if you do move the kids outdoors for some type of outdoor activity, you now know which group of kids are gonna be which group of kids for tracing purposes as yep. well. Yep. Did I get that right? Correct. God, I'm doing so good even without kids. Now I understand how oh. it's being formatted. Um, but the downside, and I have spoken to a couple of other people, Carrie Norman, the chair of the school committee, one of the things she does worry about is what's gonna happen if these 300 students, or if it gets worse, I mean, if we go continue on the, that level, yeah. what happens to the funding next year? So, um, you know, the, I guess the message is get a hold of our state delegation, get a hold of people and say, you, this is an incorrect way of funding for 21 22. You got that, it. Yeah. Pretty good, though, huh? For a novice that I grasped most of that. Not a novice, Joe. I don't believe that for a second. There you go. Ilana, thanks. I'm going to move over to something I absolutely know nothing about, which is how to be innovative. So we're going to talk to Jason a little bit. Jason, an innovation specialist, I'm just going to take it from the title. Innovation specialist thinks outside of the box. And an innovation specialist is going to say, this is the traditional way that you do things. Here are some things that we can do that are non-traditional. Help me with that. Sure. So yeah, thanks, Joe, for having me on. Um, so before the closure, I spent a lot of time moving from school to school, meeting directly with teachers and working in classrooms, really discovering what innovative things were already happening, and then figuring out, is it possible to scale this project? Can we bring it to other schools? Is it something that just exists uniquely uh, at one school? Um, and so it is, it's less about me being the one who is truly innovative. I can coach and sort of help people think outside the box, but often it's about lifting up a mirror and reminding folks of how innovative they are and then figuring out how to channel some of their amazing ideas into something that uh, could benefit the district as a whole or specific populations. Um, since the closure happened, you know, I sort of shifted more into this role of um, focusing specifically on uh, education technology and professional development. And I was, um, it was remarkable to see so many educators within the first few days step up and say, look, I'm gonna help with this. Let's train up, let's, let's get our, our staff ready for, for this closure, you know, cause we were, uh, that was, it was quite a, an experience, you know, uh, going through all of that. And so, but it also uh, 
got us prepared in some ways for the uncertainty that honestly is, is still out there. Um, for folks, you know, in public education who always have a solid plan and are really good at, you know, preparation, to be preparing for still a lot of unknown is, is stressful. Um, and, you know, honestly, the, our whole education system went through this trauma. Um, it's something that a teacher brought up today that was just a reminder um, that our, our whole system is going through this trauma um, and that uh, we're, it's important for us to bounce back. Um, and so, you know, combining the elements of training for, you know, for technology use and the community building element, they're going to be super important in those, you know, first month or so and ongoing, honestly, uh, throughout the school year. Uh, go for it. No, I, I wanted to ask you one question because it's become abundantly clear to me. Um, I say it all the time on my shows. I have a very large family. You know, a lot of my nieces and nephews are married and they have kids of their own. And I even have a grand niece who much to, against my advice, went back to work in New York City on the stock exchange. Um, so that runs the, the range of how I'm familiar with what parents are going through, teachers are going through, kids are going through. One of the things that has become abundantly clear is that a lot of the kids know the technology better than the parents. So I, I, want, I want you to, without slamming the parents, because I know they're going to watch you and they're going to say, what is he talking about? How do we balance that out going forward? Um, well, so, and that's an interesting thing. You, you know, you mentioned that the, the students do you know, excelling in technology. It's in some ways there's different kinds of technology. The, the technology that students are engaging with in some ways can be different than what we're doing in school. And so that's another key uh, element moving forward is how can we lean into youth culture a bit more um, and, and make sure that they are creators of content, not just consumers. Um, there's a lot of amazing digital tools out there and, and uh, you know, the key then for us is to sort of glean from that expansive list, like what are the key things that students need going forward? Um, and, you know, the parents, I think it's true often, right? The students know a lot, but parents are getting pretty techy now too. Um, the Somerville uh, Family Learning Collaborative, who is a key partner at Somerville Public Schools, reminded us at a, at a training recently that, you know, don't underestimate uh, uh, you know, the tech savviness of families, many of whom um, families of uh, immigrant backgrounds are using technology to stay connected with families back home uh, in other countries. So um, it's important to make sure that we don't, uh, you know, make assumptions about what we think families are going through and what we think students and teachers are going through. I was blown away. I mean, this summer and into these last, you know, few weeks, teachers have gone above and beyond, not surprisingly, but it still amazes me. Um, preparing for this school year, training themselves, enrolling in all kinds of opportunities that are provided by like nonprofit partners. And then of course, district opportunities that uh, generally are led by internal staff, a range of, of administrators and teachers. And then also we have a series of, of great partners uh, recently, even just today, we were looking through a uh, uh, back to school blueprint um, with the Rennie Center. Uh, we're going to be working closely uh, with Facing History in the Harvard Graduate School of Education and Boston College around uh, the deep equity work that we're doing in the district. Um, and then, of course, some of our, you know, uh, Family Learning Collaborative have been key supporters in all of this and will play a major role in how we engage with families, uh, specifically families whose first language is not English. And it's going to take this village, you know, our nonprofit partners like you guys, Somerville Media Center. We're looking to, you know, expand our partnership with you as well as um, the huge success that was uh, Summer Camp 2020 this year that was put together very quickly by Somerville Media Center and, some, and fund, founded, uh, or funded by the Somerville Education Foundation. We're hoping to integrate any of these local nonprofit partners into like, an after school um, an offering of after school sessions that uh, provide students with a, a range of enrichment opportunities, but also potentially connecting during the day as, as like a virtual field trip. Um, so the answer, answer your question, yes, there's general ideas of, okay, where, where are we, where do people land? But uh, we don't wanna hold any sort of assumptions about where kids are and what they're doing. If anything, 
try to be good listeners, try to be as flexible and adaptable as possible, knowing that some of the things we're planning for right now aren't going to work. And we have to be able to adjust on the fly and we're going to continue to kind of build this while we, while we fly the plane. Uh, and it's, it's going to be difficult, but teachers, they're going to lead the way, you know, I mean, with all, with administrators and other support staff, of course, and families, but it's, you know, it's really, it's that connection between like paraprofessionals, teachers, and their students. They are here at the core of this. And I, I really, you know, if I'm looking into the glass ball, it's, it's really, I think students and teachers and, and uh, support staff are really going to help define what this, what the next six months look like. And parts of me are, you know, terrified and I'm, you know, but at the other, I'm also really excited for this opportunity to reimagine, maybe rethink how we experience public education. Well, the other part of it too, Jason, I, I mean, I, I get totally what you're saying and thank you for digging yourself out from underneath what I said, which was <laughs> there's this digital divide between parents and students. So now they can just call me because you defended them and very, <laughs> bravo, very well done. So I, I, the other thing I wanted to touch on though is the resources that a parents who may not have the means for their kids to stay in touch. So I, either one can take this, Ilana or you. Do, are we sure that all of our kids in the public school system have a laptop or a device that they will be able to keep up with and one that works, one that has the proper uh, power to it? And the second part of that question is their connectivity to the internet. What have we done as a city school committee, as a school system to make sure every single one of those kids has a functioning laptop at the top speed, internet speed that we can give them? Well, I'll, I'll take this first and then I'm sure Jason will have things to add, but um, this is an ongoing process. And I know that this was a big piece of what administrators were doing all through the spring was making sure every kid had laptops and connectivity. Um, I know the district has invested $72,000 in some various from COVID, some from some CARES COVID funds to connectivity and helping families get high speed Wi Fi if they need it. Um, I don't have numbers in front of me of how many students still don't have it, but I know we got it to hundreds of kids in the spring. Um, and also, just one other thing to add to that, Jason mentioned the Centerville Family Learning Collaborative, which has been great through all of this. And one of the things they do is have a family liaison at each school who really knows the kids and the families and what they need. And this has been a really good point person for everything that the family may need, even outside of just the bounds of school. And just this past um, year, we voted for this coming year to have those family liaisons be full time at all the schools. So that will definitely help capacity for figuring out a lot of these issues. Jason. Sure, so uh, another change. So one of the issues we faced back during the closure was the variability of machines out there, right? Whether it's our own devices, uh, students were using phones, their parents' devices, uh, and they all interact differently, right? Um, we don't have sort of a uniform uniform tech out there. So that's just the nature of it. And that will continue in some way, shape or form, right? There's always going to be some level of variability. Uh, but a big step towards uh, uniformity was when we were able to distribute um, Chromebooks throughout the district. We purchased new Chromebooks for all new high school, for all, for the high school, uh, for any high school student uh, who came in would get a brand new Chromebook. Um, and I think part of that is because they're right there. They're in those final two to four years or their seniors this year and they really need their hands on the newest tech available as, as they get ready for now a shifting uh, landscape in higher ed and in you know out in the workforce um, and at this point uh, I believe I can say that uh, Chromebooks have been distributed now um, K to 12 and so the hope by having Chromebooks in the hands of every kid who goes to Somerville Public Schools is that um, you have sort of a unified machine that we can count on. Now, of course, there is some variability across those machines, and I should also include pre-K in there. I believe we just sent out some uh, touchscreen uh, combination, touchscreen Chromebook um, devices to pre-K and possibly K uh, that will allow them 
more interactive, you know, for a more interactive experience because they can actually touch the screen. And then it's something they can use later as they begin to, you know, uh, learn to type. So uh, that's, a, that's a huge, huge upgrade um, because now when we push out new updates to programs, it'll, it'll touch every Chromebook, you know, every, every device should receive the same kind of update. Students should have the same kind of access to all the different tools that we're using. Um, and, you know, so I feel like that's a great step towards having a more equitable approach, although it's, it's um, I guess you could say it's more of an equal approach. Um, and for students who need more, the idea is they're being provided with an extra device if that's something that their uh, IEP plan calls for. Uh, and those tend to be sort of case by case situations. Well, I don't, I don't want to crow, but I have been known to crow before. So if there are things that the Media Center can help you with in terms of devices or high speed, um, certainly a Media Center should have those connections where I can pick up the phone and call uh, Dr. Monaco at Tufts and say, you owe me, I need another 50 Chromebooks, make it happen. I don't want to usurp Mary Skipper or Joe Curtitoni or anybody else who's working on this, but I have ways, Jason. So, sure. I think well, you know, a clear need is definitely hotspots. I would imagine, you know, there's there's some families that aren't necessarily able to to um, engage with the Comcast Essentials plan, which is really great. Um, but at the same time, the reality is that uh, extra bills like that aren't aren't something that families can, can and, always and handle. You know. That's more or less what I'm talking about is a supplemental mm -hmm. to what you folks, the great work you go, folks have already been doing. Um, let me go back to one thing. You know, we've been talking about a lot about K through K through six and then six through the high school kids. If we go virtual, I, I assume I'm going to make a big assumption here that that would still include going back to the temporary classrooms in front of the high school. So, um, there is an and a um, and no, not necessarily an end date, but we are uh, committed to being fully remote for the high school until the new high school building opens. Okay, which is slated to be the end of the year, December, January, uh, approximately. Okay, so and that's committed to that because the the city engineers looked at the old building and said, "There's no, there's no." there's no way to retrofit these. It doesn't make sense to retrofit this. So, so a lot of the reason I, yeah, the reason I asked the question that way was because it was posed to me last week. Mm -hmm. Are the high school kid, even though we don't have a new high school, are the high school kids going back into those trailers? And I said, good question. I don't know. The answer is no. Got it. So moving forward, what have we got um, that the community can help the school system with? What information do we need to get out there today? Um, what do the parents need to be st to start thinking about? What can the community partners do to assist either the school committee, the school system, the parents, the teachers, the community partners? Let us know so we can start getting that information out as well. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, I'd say parents getting their kids ready to start school remotely in the you know strongest way they can, making sure they've got an area in their room, in another room, whatever makes the most sense, some sort of set aside designated area to be working. Um, I would say, yeah, that's the, the main one I can think of right now. I got a lot of friends in the interior design world. You want me to put the word out to them to start sending sure. in videos of how parents set up secluded areas of the house or the bedroom? Yeah, or, yeah. that's fun, a fun way to engage, sure. Here's the new classroom at home, guys. Yep. You know, Jason. Sure. Yeah. The importance of taking breaks, you know, we're as humans, we're not really designed to be on a screen all day, every day. Um, and so uh, with the limitations in front of us, we need to be uh, more vigilant about our time uh, and, and making sure that we're even, even if it means just walking around the house or just getting a quick, fresh, you know, breath of fresh air, um, you know, there's, and also thinking about posture and stretching, right? I mean, there's all kinds of other, you know, um, unintended consequences, right? That could potentially rear 
their ugly head. So it's like, all right, what are we doing with our bodies? What are we doing with our minds? How are we taking breaks? How are we, you know, um, leveraging our own expertise? I think that's a, that's a big one too, is, is for parents, it's like being patient, of course, with, with uh, the schools as we prepare, but also telling their kids like, hey, get in there and talk about what you're interested in. You know, when teachers are saying, hey, how, do we, how should we redesign or how should we rethink what we're doing? We need kids to step up and, and get their voice out there. And we need teachers to help create those environments. Um, so it's- those are, it, those are great suggestions, Jason. It leads me to another question coming from, you know, when I attended school in the one single classroom log cabin, H how do we handle breaks for the kids? recess in the traditional world you have the bell rang recess go out into the yard how are we going to handle it in the virtual world well we have a, an incredible library of, of videos and resources that our pe teachers uh, put together um, and so i think the idea is to try to incorporate some of these kinds of breaks not just um, from the pe specialists but also just as you go through a lesson making sure that all your lessons incorporate some sort of break and in terms of recess, that is, that's a great question, Joe. I'm, I, I'm not completely sure what exactly recess is going to look like, um, but I imagine our, our, our team will, will come up with some interesting ideas. Okay. I asked the question because when I looked at the clock last night at 9.30 and I was on the last Zoom call of the day, I said, wow, I didn't take a break today. So mm -hmm. I think it's very important. I'm just going to emphasize what you were saying. It's important for the physical and mental well-being of all of us, whether it's business, teachers, students, parents, anybody, you've got to put the devices away for a certain amount during the day. And so with that, go ahead, Ilana. Well, I was just gonna say that's why I talked about the sort of big picture schedule, how the kids would be sort of in school from eight to 2.30, but we certainly don't envision that they'll be sitting in front of their laptop for that entire period. Because as you mentioned, that's not good for anybody. That's great. So built-in breaks will certainly be part of that. Good, because when I get, you know, emails at 2.30 in the morning, and then I get a phone call at 8 and say, how come you didn't answer my email? <laughs> I, I kind of wonder where people's heads are these days. So, you know, my, my congratulations to the school committee, um, to the superintendent's office, to the parents, the teachers, the students, everybody is just, I know no one likes this. I mean, very few would possibly like being you know, at home with mom and dad or with caretaker or during school. Because they, as you said, Ilana, at the beginning, they miss their friends. They miss their contemporaries. And the teachers miss their contemporaries. And the parents miss their coworkers. I, I give so many of you so much credit for, for getting it this far. So we're gonna sign off for today. Next week, um, we will do another update with the school committee, but both of you, or welcome back anytime. Just muscle carry, carry Norman out of the way and say, we want to come back. But you may have to fight off Mary Skipper for that because she wants to come back as well once this thing settles down a little bit. So thank right. you so much, Ilana Krepchen from Award 2 in the City of Somerville School Committee member and Jason Behrens. He is the Innovation Director, Assistant Superintendent, Assistant Director. No, look at him. I embarrassed him. Jason Behrens, Innovation Specialist from the City of Somerville, Somerville Public School Systems. Thank you so much for joining me. As always, Joe Lynch for the Somerville Media Center. Stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time.